Hey y'all, no hit runs are all the rage in the Dark Souls genre. The fact of a hard game being played perfectly really appeals to the monkey side of my brain. Look at these absolute units who don't take a single hit from an enemy. And these gamers sometimes complete whole games, series, and genres arguably without ever getting smacked. So small, no hit runs! We did it! Doom, as an FPS franchise, has prided itself on being a hard but fair game. That being said, getting hit is still not as fair as the Souls games, but typically, deaths are fully avoidable because unfair attacks are pretty uncommon. So, the devs added a unique difficulty option so players can take this to the extreme. Ultra Nightmare. To complete this challenge, you have to play through the game on the highest difficulty, but also do it without dying a single time. Because if you die, you'd be sent back to the beginning of the game. Casually, one of the greatest achievements to do in these games is to 100% the game on this difficulty. This is my first gameplay. So, with all those tidbits of information, you probably know where this is going. Hi, I'm Rytro with an underscore, and what I did was 100% Ultra Nightmare every modern Doom game back to back to back to back. This includes the Doom 2016 reboot, Doom Eternal, and Doom Eternal's Ancient Gods DLCs. Playing through all these campaigns would take a casual player over 30 hours to beat, but me? I'm not a casual. With years of first-person shooter speedrunning experience, I could do all of this in about 6 hours. But that's only accounting for speed, not for doing it deathlessly. But how do I go about setting an accomplishment like this? What strategies did I have to do to come up to accomplish this task? And most important of all, how much of my life did I waste attempting this challenge? That's what this video is all about. I'm gonna go over the whole run, explain why this is FPS's god run, and tell the story of how I conquered this challenge and go over my pain in an excruciating detail. Which, I would love to hold you on by the video essayist thread of, oh, did I beat it or did I not? But no, I did it, and I'm too goddamn proud. And yes, this video is a touch on the long side. It's a four game, 100% anthology run, so it will take some time to break it down. Feel free to watch it in 15 minute long chunks and then come back later. Timestamps are located in the description. Okay, now let us begin. So first things first, we have to ask a certain question. Has anyone done anything like this before? And the answer is yes. Two people, by my research, have done runs that are approximately equivalent. The first person to complete this was Arrhythmia, who ultra nightmared all four campaigns in about 12 hours. An achievement as impressive as his skincare regimen. I mean, look at how, look at the beautiful bald head of his. Do it! That's what I thought! You fucking suck! I'm better than all three of these games! Alright. But alas, they were just going for completion of the campaigns and not 100%. So no, 100% can eat my dick. 100% is boring as fuck. So analyzing this was not the biggest help to me. And the next person who did this was Maynard, who completed the challenge in just under 9 hours in real time. They did get 100% completion on Ultra Nightmare, so they officially get the party hat of the first person to do this challenge. Yes! Yes! Yeah! Gun run, baby! Woo! Oh, shit! To which I'll say, no disrespect to Maynard. The dude deserves all the respect in the world for getting the first completion of this, but I wasn't impressed. A lot of the strategies they did were rudimentary and unoptimal. As well, overall had very messy sections. So, it looks like any strategies they used would not be too insightful for my run either. So, what I decided to do was I would adapt all the strategies I used from speedrunning the campaigns and apply them to this challenge. Because I guess speedrunner brain says that if you can't be the first to complete something, you can sure as heck be the fastest to do it. So, I'm gonna do you all a favor and skip over the preparation phase from here on out. As it was mostly me following the speedrun route for each game, getting a time of each individual campaign that I was happy with, and then making small adjustments for consistency. But starting in August of 2023, I would do attempts about three times a week, leaving days where I couldn't complete a run to practicing sections of the run I did not get to. But what about the run itself? And what was I doing? Well, I guess the short answer is you could just watch the run and figure it out for yourself, but this video is more meant as a educated walkthrough where I'll explain everything. So let's not take up any more time. I'll get into the run. We start this with the first Doom game, 2016. Which, it isn't the first Doom, but you know, when a series has over 2,000 entries, you gotta start somewhere. Welcome to our demon-invaded territory known as Mars. 
For those who don't know, this game is all about arena shooting and approaching fights very carefully. And it also has the worst early game out of every Doom. All early fights have a lot of RNG, are really hard to do optimally, so I gotta make j Oh. Yeah, turns out you don't have to do them. Normally, there's this meter in the top right of the screen that tracks combat rating, how many demons you've killed. However, this doesn't show up until the third level, so that means no fights have to be done early on. But how did that boost work? That's what's called a rail boost. I've explained this many times in other vids, so I'll keep it short. Basically, when a player barely misses a jump, the game will give the player enough speed to make the jump to make it feel more fair for our monkey brains. But some certain surfaces, like rails, don't reset the player's speed, allowing us to zoom and skip encounters. And since no fights are tracked, the first two levels are basically a mix of going to grab secrets and getting to the end as fast as possible. And the reason why I'm not spending too much time on it is that this section is very deterministic. It's straightforward. We grab a door through a floor, the only instance of the run, we platform to skip some unneeded walking, we grab collectibles, and then we rail boost. What you see is what you get. Oh, and right at the end of the second level, there is an unskippable cutscene of about three minutes. Riveting gameplay. And now, at the beginning of this next level, combat rating is tracked. I have added a tracker to your helmet's display. We're thrown into my favorite levels of 2016, Boundary through Tower. These levels are random fests for consistency, as we have to rely on enemy AI for some combat strategies, but the game is not at all consistent in that aspect. Most of my UN Anthology attempts died in these three levels, and it's not even close. So, while I reset nearly 100 times, let's talk of what 100% entails in these games. Doom 2016 requires you to master every weapon and its two modifications, master all 12 runes, and master your suit and gather every other permanent upgrade. Oh, and also pick up over 150 collectibles. So you can see, perhaps the hardest part about this game is routing 100% as there are plenty mastery challenges that you have to complete in order to, well, get 100%. But luckily, the nerds in the community have routed the most optimal places to master each dumb thing and what order. So a big part of my task while running it is to keep in mind the progression in comparison to what is ideal. If I fall behind on a mastery due to some bullshit, I had to be able to route in where to make up for it later. Back to Foundry, despite it not having any tough demons, we have to deal with a lot of combat here. A big trick you'll see in both games is quick swapping. Basically, each weapon has a cooldown, like the shotgun, which you have to pump in between shots. But why pump the shotgun when you can, I don't know, say, swap to another weapon and fire that one? The best part about it is that the shotgun will pump while it's unequipped, meaning that I can fire it immediately when I swap back to it. This concept is applicable to every gun in the game to some extent, so I'll be swapping between all of them for various purposes, like, I don't know, killing things quickly. And now that Pastro has finally gotten past Foundry, we do something a little unconventional. We get out of bounds. We have a technique known as paper clipping, and it's called that because the walls in this game are actually paper thin, and if you can find a spot where the textures don't perfectly align, you can just walk through it. And now, why is this done? Because otherwise, we'd have to watch the villain of the game, Olivia, pantomime for about one and a half minutes. And after all, watching cutscenes is slow. Speaking of which, I didn't talk about the lore. You see, this Olivia here, this person here, she's trying to blow open a portal to hell. One that's bigger than the current one she already made. So we need to stop her. But we just cut her off while she's still in front of the door, so how did she get that? You know, speedruns break the lore of games. Let's move on. And immediately after that, we do the only instance of damage boosting in this run. And no, throwing a grenade at your feet in real life will not do this. Trust me, I've tried. It's how I no longer have a leg up on the speedrun competition. Another subtle thing is that this game locks your rune slots in order to make sure you can only use one at this point in the game. You unlock more once you've collected a few other runes. However, that's one big lie. If you select the unlocked rune slot with your mouse, but hover over the lock slot with keyboard controls, and then just click, suddenly, your lock slot has your rune equipped. Get hacked on, devs. With this, we are able to start mastering runes as fast as possible. The next unique thing to do is to farm combat rating. Now, this game, 
doesn't track every encounter on the map, but rather each demon I kill will increase the combat rating by a set amount. And once I reach the combat rating threshold for the level, that's 100%. In summary, I don't have to do every combat. I don't have to kill every single demon for Hundo. I just have to fill all five blips of this meter. So a valid strategy is spawning in the same encounter multiple times and repeat it all the necessary times in order to get enough combat rating. But why do this rather than just do all the combat regularly? As it turns out, some encounters require us to watch long cutscenes in order to trigger them, which is super slow. But a problem of not watching these cutscenes is that they also trigger the door to the end of the level to open up. If only there was some boost that we could do in such a way that... The dangerous nature of these levels is exemplified here. Say hi to the Revenants. The game expects us to have some health upgrades, so we don't instantly get death when we get hit by the rocket guys. But over the course of the run, we specced Doomguy into a glass cannon, as we only picked up ammo upgrades this entire time. And you can die instantly here. A lot. So continuing this level, we pick up the double jump, grab our last ammo upgrade, and excuse me! Why are you shooting your gun so much? You need that for the dams. Out of all my time speedrunning this game, this is by far the most common question I've been asked about in the chat. So, allow me to explain. There are two runes, Vacuum and Ammo Boost, that require us to pick up loot 200 and 500 times respectively in order to master them. A common loot in this game is ammo, and you cannot pick up ammo if you are full on ammo, thus my habit of lighting up every surface with hot molten lead. So I can pick up all these shrinies for optimal rune mastery later, to which the game needs to get back at me for ruining the precious environments by giving me hell for the rest of the level, literally. Now when doing optimal strats, I have to skip an encounter, which leaves me very low on combat rating. This is called banana skip, because the strat we jump on looks like a banana. We're very creative in the Doom community. Which I would tell you more, but let's split to the secret level. We're not going to it just yet, but um, trust me, I'll grab it at some point, I'm sure. And we go up to Olivia. Where it's this is not the end! It's only the beginning! Alright, we're 40 minutes into this game, Olivia, but whatever. Now this is the last fight of the level, and we don't have much combat rating. And this encounter, how it's structured, is that it ends after a certain amount of time. Thus, we need to kill enemies to get 100%. Normally, it would be fine, but skipping that last encounter makes me have to kill things very quickly, making it harder. But what makes it the hardest is that we also gotta grab that secret level. Now, when I hear the final timer begin its countdown, we grab an invincibility power-up to avoid dying from fall damage and this big-ass laser, and then we drop all the way down to get to the secret level, just in time for the tower to explode and send us into hell. Wow. Welcome to the mid game. This next part of the run is where money runners say it gets fun, because the run takes a break from all the speed tech to focus on combat. We have to do a lot of it. In this level, we gain full access to our three most broken weapons in the game. The rocket launcher, the super shotgun, and the gauss rifle. All combat from here on out focuses on the effectiveness of these three weapons, of which their weapon mods are what makes them busted. Rocket launcher's remote detonation mastery gives us a second explosion, meaning each rocket does the work of two separate shots. Super shotgun has the double shot, meaning that we can now shoot twice before reloading making it one of the highest burst damage sources. Unfortunately, we only just start working on the mastery in Cadinger, so we'll see the outcome of the work of mastery in this in about a level or two. And the Gauss Cannon has Siege Mode, a high damage base drop that can kill most enemies in one shot. The Siege Mode shot also has a bug with it that allows us to fire it instantly when swapping to the Gauss Cannon. So we can skip its relatively long charge-up time, making all the game devs hate us how much we're ignoring balance. It's 
very easy to do. All you gotta do is swap to the Gauss Cannon while holding down right click, and then press left click. Yeah, it's so easy, some people do it on accident. And with these three weapons, we are unstoppable. Well, until we aren't. My favorite strategy in this level is how we leave one combat arena early, only to come back later when the arena is reused for a second fight, and there might be two fights here. However, thanks to a power-up, I'm four times as powerful. And also, fun facts, this level has so much combat rating that we could just full-on skip arena and still have plenty to finish the level. And get back to Mars. This level introduces a new annoying thing, timers. This level hates it when you kill things instantly, like you being a speedrunner or something. So it will delay spawns of later enemies if we kill the first enemies too quick. I have to intentionally kill enemies slowly, like these pinkies for example, in order to be fast, which is... ew. Oh, by the way, we skipped 80% of the level with one gauss boost. It's just that easy. <coughs> oh, remember the Gauss Cannon? Oh, it's not the only busted thing when dealing with enemies. Each time it's fired, it provides recoil that pushes Doom Guy back. Using this speed allows us to jump over a massive pit to the end of the level. But we still have to grab everything eventually. It's just faster to bounce around the level like this. Blah blah blah, we, we do some encounters, some combat. Uh. The summoner enemy shows up. You can expect what it does. Every summoner can only spawn in a certain number of enemies, except for this one. This summoner will summon unlimitedly until it is killed, and it's the only one in the game that does this. And we abuse that to farm combat rating, as some encounters are very much out of the way from grabbing the collectibles. But if you're worried about it being too easy, well, I have news for you. We're just about to get to the hardest challenge in the whole run, the in-flight mobility rune trial. The hardest challenge to stay awake during Ayo. Come back, come back, come back. At least we get to the train level now. I'm, I mean the train cutscene. Yeah, I'm disappointed too. And we're in the last level of the mid game, the Armed Response Coalition. This level is tough. The first and last encounter of this level are so deadly that it caused a lot of runs to end here. It's personally for me the hardest level in the run to survive. But after the first encounter. What's more deadly is the out of bounds. Before we can get a secret weapon, which you all may be waiting for, we have to talk to Mecha Jesus, who has a plan on how to stop the demonic evasion now that it's been blown into the beginning of time. He says that maybe a key to stopping it could be in Olivia's research lab, and because we are the Doom Guy, we might be able to discover something Hayden and the others just couldn't. Him explaining this is the single longest cutscene in the game. It lasts almost three minutes. So obviously, we skip it by paper clipping right before the cutscene. But the process of skipping it, it puts us out of bounds right next to a secret level. So it just makes sense to grab that sweet, sweet secret to skip pulling the lever and traveling to it later. But we have to be careful about grabbing the secret because we could fall into the level. And if we fall into the level, 
we're trapped. I have a very specific setup I do to make sure that this doesn't happen. And I also have to do another setup to hit a trigger to make sure enemies spawn in for the next encounter. Of course, we get back inbounds by chainsawing a nearby enemy, snapping us to a spot next to them. Then after some somewhat trivial combat and movement, we gauss boost to grab our BFG, the best friend's girlfriends. This girlfriend, when used effectively, is an entire room clear. I like to call the ammo it uses Karen. And thanks to me, I've already mastered ammo boost, which gives each ammo drop in the game around a 5% chance to drop me BFG ammo instead. Now normally, this ammo is so rare and scattered to make sure balance isn't thrown out of whack, but now we can possibly get some after killing an enemy. And thank goodness we do a lot of enemy killing in this run. But we get to the last encounter, and I want to go into detail because this is a very creative instance of farming. A rune called Intimacy is Best is the worst rune in the game. It gives every demon in glory kill state damage resistance, so you can't kill them by accidentally shooting them. The only issue is that going in for a glory kill is slow. So speedrunners shoot most demons to death while they're in that state to kill them quicker. So it's a straight nerf. It's a nerf. To master this garbage rune, we have to put 100 demons in the glory kill state. And there are about 15 zombies here. Zombies are the weakest enemies in the game. So we have to kill these engineers to make sure that when they explode, they don't kill the zombies. Then we get them all into glory kill with a precisely charged heat blast to do the right amount of damage. While they're in glory kill, we kill some other demons and some skulls that just spawned in, and when they're dead, the zombies will be out of glory kill. With another heat blast, all the zombies are back in glory kill. We chainsaw to refill ammo for this upcoming fight, and then when the zombies are out of glory kill for the third time, we BFG, putting them in glory kill before shortly killing them after. So we put all these zombies in the glory kill state three times in the span of about 10 seconds, which, if lucky, gives us about 40 out of the 100 ticks required for the Intimacy is Best rune mastery, if we did it well. This is just done in a way that makes my brain feel warm and tingly, and I hope you can appreciate that too. But after. The fight is not easy. If I'm slow on killing some enemies in this last encounter, I will not have enough combat rating to get 100% and thus have to restart the whole run. Disengaged. Many, many runs have ended here because I was low on JK, not dead, lol. Welcome to Lazarus, where this level is nothing too different from what we've seen before. Combat, working on masteries, and combat. I love this level. It's probably my favorite in the speedrun, because it has long hallways that make bunny hopping easy. Uh, I didn't explain that, let's get into it. This game has it that jumping right when you hit the ground will conserve your speed from before the jump. But the double jump in this game will give Doomguy a lot of air drag, slowing him down immensely. So, in reality, you actually have a very short window to bunny hop, as you have to do it before you slow down from your feet dragging against the floor, but not jump early enough to piss off the gods of aerodynamics. This whole window is about a 60th of a second to hit, which is very hard to do for most of the run. However, in Lazarus, we are dealing with really flat ground, which means it's very easy to tell when I'm hitting the ground as the timing is perfectly consistent. And it just, it feels so satisfying to pull some of this movement off. At the halfway point of the level, we get to an interesting arena where once we complete the fight, we can open a pathway to the elevator. However, you could just activate this pathway without completing the fight. <laughs> we need to kill some of the encounter in order to have enough combat rating for the level, but we don't have to do all of it. It's just kind of funny. <laughs> After the elevator, we get to Olivia's office where upon gazing upon an ancient slab, it lets us know our next goal. To obtain an ancient artifact known as the Crucobile, which might be relevant for the rest of the run. But that's boring. You know what's riveting? Intimacy is best. Yep, we're still working on this goddamn rune. And this is the final encounter where hopefully I'll master it. And it's a little interesting on how farming works here. 
Demons spawn in these games via three different methods. There are set spawns, where the enemy will appear at the same point every single time it spawns. And there are also times when it's completely random where an enemy will spawn in the arena, where the game will just arbitrarily pick a location from a few options. And the one that's relevant here is spawns that are based on your line of sight. This arena specifically wants imps to spawn in your cone of vision. So we look in between these two pillars and stand as close to the slab as possible. This will cause five imps to consistently spawn directly in front of us. To where if we charge three pips in the heat blasts, we will instantly put them in glory kill, giving us progression for intimacy is best. And then we kill them all with a siege mode shot, farming siege mode shots mastery as well. And after farming more than someone's thoughts and prayers posts on Twitter, we pick up our final rune and do the final fight of the level. But we're not done yet. We get to the first boss fight of this game, the Cyber Demon. The perfect fusion between demonic creatures and technology. And I'm just wondering, oh god, whatever will I- Yeah, it just kind of dies. But wait, it's alive again! Oh no! Yeah, boss fights are a joke in this game thanks to the BFG's hidden mechanics. This game is hard-coded to deal BFG damage to enemies per frame that the game runs at. And the weapon wheel slows down in-game time, but not the frame rate the game runs at, allowing for a bunch of damage with the effort of pushing a single button. And before a YouTube commenter says, Uh, just fight the boss normally. Uh, this ruins the fun. This BFG time slow strategy saves two seconds over doing this fight glitchless. So go to hell, like I am right now. Well, in hell, what's waiting for us is combat, and I would like to talk about a lot of it, but these levels are basically just optimization after optimization after optimization. I think it's just better if you were to watch. Oh, but midway through, there are two very important farming sessions here. Saving Throw is the rune that saves you from death. Makes sense. It does this by stopping fatal damages from killing you, and giving you slow motion to react to your fatal danger. To master this rune, we need to kill 10 enemies while the slow-mo effect is triggered. Now, we only get one chance to master this, so we BFG to kill all these lost souls, and then deal fatal damage to us by splashing a rocket at our feet, getting us all the mastery for the challenge. Whew! You know what, I'm not worried whatsoever every time I get to this part of the run. I'm, I'm not. And the next cool one is Rich Get Richer, which is the next biggest help to us. This is a rune that gives me infinite ammo if I have above 100 armor. Capitalism hard at work. To master this rune, I have to fill my armor to max 12 times. So, while at full armor, I stand in the acid to take a little bit of damage, but then get that damage back by using siphon grenades to steal armor from these zombies, making me constantly lose 1 HP from environmental damage, and then gain the armor back from the grenades, mastering this rune nearly instantly. And you know where this means, we have infinite ammo as long as I'm 75 armor or greater through the run, which is very doable if you know what you're doing.
Having fought our way through hell for this, the second boss, the Hell Guards. These demons are super powerful guards of hidden artifacts and locations of importance. Oh, but wait, there's two of them at... As I said, a little bit of a joke. Four seconds saved in this boss fight by doing that, by the way. And we're at the home stretch where we get back to Mars in order to, well, get back to hell. And it starts with the last out of bounds of the run. This skip is super scary, as we have to jump all around the facility to grab a secret, and then we have to jump back inbounds to trigger two encounters at one time. Welcome to the late game, where Amaboos shows its overpoweredness, quite apparently. But, we still have one of the most difficult sections of the run. We have to kill three demons with one grenade, and there is only one optimal spot to do it in this level. Ah, phew. I've, I've lost. I've lost too many runs to that. Anyways, And then, after killing Daddy to get enough energy to tear a hole in hell, and no, I will not be explaining that, we move on to Argent Diner, where we have the final combat. Yeah, as I said, broken. But after the first arena, we have to finish a couple of very easy masteries on this random supply of 10 zombies. Now, we would do them earlier, but there's no need to because th this encounter just exists here. But we have to do Liberation Skip. And this skip is called Liberation, because if you fail it, you are liberated from your run. Fuck. The boost is not at all difficult. However, it is pretty precise, and one slip-up will cause you to fail and die instantly. This skip has ended one of my anthology attempts in quite a few 2016 runs. But... Because we have practically everything upgraded at this point, we have to use every tool in our arsenal to fight- The only barrier to stop us from completing the game is the last challenge. Kill two barons with one shot. Barons are one of the biggest, most HP tanky enemies in the game, and the BFG does not count towards this challenge. So, while I wait for a specific part of the literal last wave of enemies in the game, I grab a 4 damage power-up, and... Yeah, honestly, Tony Hawk has nothing on me. With that done, we just have to stab the final Hell Ghost and get to the final boss, Olivia herself. Except, no, she's actually the Spider Mastermind. It's your fault for expecting anything more after I told you two separate times how the BFG was remarkably overpowered. And with a quick check of the menus to confirm that we have finished Doom with 100% completion. And we are done with Doom 2016 in about two and a half hours of time. There's no time to rest. Okay, welcome to your eternal hell. What happened after Doom 2016? Quit asking questions, you nerd. Now, at this stage, you might be asking how many runs have made it to eternal, and the answer is three which seems like a relatively small amount given I've done a total of 98 attempts before my final run, but one of those three runs made it. Meaning, I have a 33% success rate with Eternal. Why is that? Well, here's some context I've hit up until this point. Despite me having world record in 100% Ultra Nightmare for 2016, I'm actually way less experienced in that game. Going by hours, I have over 2,000 in Eternal, and in Doom 2016, I have 700. So clearly, I'm way more competent at Eternal than 2016. I just have more game feel and more understanding of Eternal systems. As well, these games just have fundamental design differences that make this type of run easier for Eternal. In 2016, you have to plan encounters to make sure you have full health going in, because the only way to effectively get health back was to kill enemies, and if you've gotten to low health in the first place, you already fucked up and you're likely gonna die. Meanwhile, Eternal is sitting here after doing a line of coke out of a stripper's ear canal and tells you, no health? 
No problem. Because there are several avenues for getting health back. You can freeze enemies to make them drop health. You have protection from abilities instantly killing you. And you can light demons on fire with a flamethrower to get back armor. A concept that no one will ever understand, but it sounds very funny. And as well, it just is way more generous with demons dropping health in this game. So suffice it to say, it's all downhill from here. Lore-wise, we need to stop the demonic invasion of Earth, where Mars was unable to contain it. In order to do that, we need to kill three Hell Priests, specific demons that are vital to the ritual keeping the connection between Hell and Earth open. And we begin the game with us killing one immediately. Cool. And we get to the first level, Hell on Earth, which is honestly the worst part of this game. Nearly every spawn in each encounter is random, meaning if you watch your favorite Eternal speedrunner, they'll reset in this level as often as it takes me to complete this run. And you may notice, I'm not doing all the speedrun optimal strats for this and some levels. Well, since this run is long, <laughs> I have to adapt a different mindset from single game speedruns. For example, this punch boost in the middle of Hell on Earth may be fast, but it's also inconsistent. I may have an 80% success rate, but leaving the run up to a 1 in 5 chance, 2.5 hours in, is clearly a no-go. I want something as consistent as my upload schedule is not. So, if you see me being bad, just know that it's all planned and intentional. So, after getting through the level and scaring off every hologram by cocking a shotgun, we have to figure out where they all went to. So, we need to go to Exultia on Sentinel Prime to get a Celestial Locator. What are all of those places I'm saying? I don't know, I think this is set up for later. The most important thing about Exultia is that we get the dash power up, which highly increases our ability to dodge and react to incoming damage. Which, I want to talk about the movement in this game, as it's way more complex than what Doom 2016 has. For one, the main tech in this game is known as Lurch Hopping, which is like bunny hopping, but better. When the Doom Slayer hits the ground, the camera will bob down and forward a little bit, trying to simulate the visual effect if you were to jump in real life. That animation is actually a real effect to the character model that gives a little bit of speed. So jumping from that Lurch animation will stop the game from resetting the speed from the bob, and you can keep that speed for whatever movement you're doing after. So in summary, jumping as we hit the ground will accelerate us. This lurch mechanic is the primary reason we pick up air control in this game, and we will never give it up. We can conserve our speed around corners way easier thanks to increased air acceleration the room gives us. And the lack of such a lurch mechanic is why we never used in-flight mobility in 2016. As well, the dash power-up helps us way more in the speed department. Basically, we can cancel the deceleration from the dash by hitting certain walls and inclines, allowing us to keep that speed and use it to skip some unrequired sections or to move quickly through sections we gotta traverse through. Moving on, we get the Celestial Locator from Novik and now we need to get betrayed, so we go to hell, fight a bunch of demons, and mark our ways to Commander Valen. But since this is 100%, we have to do some fun things, like this boost, and this Slayer Gate. Slayer Gates are just hard optional encounters, and this one has a weird quirk where you can end it early. This is because the clear condition is all enemies are dead. So if we kill everything in wave two, but before wave three spawns in, we're able to move on. And remember about us meeting the betrayer Valen? Well, I'm a speedrunner and I have social anxiety, so I'm just gonna skip him and move on to the next level. This is the worst level because we don't have any weapons in our arsenal. However, the game doesn't care that we don't have them and will try to kill us anyway. The reason why every speedrunner hates this level is that Cultist Base is a level built on doing very little things very correctly or suffering a death or major time loss. But all that's pretty boring. So let's talk about the 100% criteria of Doom Eternal. Well, it's way less to keep track of than 2016. We have to collect all the runes, collect every codex entry, find every secret track by the end of level menu, and master every weapon. However, we don't have to do every weapon mastery. As a late game collectible, there are mastery tokens. Mastery tokens let you skip out on the fun of mastering a weapon by doing the challenge, and instead give up a token to master it. So, realistically, we only have to master half of the weapon mods, not all of them. And as a casual, this disappointed me. However, I like this as it's less of a toll on my monkey brain. 
Another way Eternal is different than Doom 2016 is, is that hot swapping is actually buffed. You see, while each weapon in 2016 had an internal cooldown on when it could be fired next, you still had to wait that cooldown, but in Eternal, whenever you swap a weapon, that weapon's cooldown is just instantly reset. A funny case of hot swapping that you've seen me use is punch swapping. This game considers your fist a weapon for the purposes of swapping. So, I punch, swap to the heavy cannon, and can fire the precision bolt again before it's cooled down. Wait, wait a second. But yeah, the bread and butter of hot swapping is the heavy cannon's precision bolt. This weapon has the fastest DPS when you factor in swap speed, so most of the time the alpha rotation of this game is swapping between the PB and some other weapon. Oh. But after all this pain of cultist space, we get onto the train level. Yes! Woo! The train level lasts 10 seconds. Fucking hell, why, do I, why am I... Uh, regardless, we're on Doom Hunter base now, and I want to touch on one aspect you don't likely hear about this game. It's bugginess. All right, all right, all right, that's way too broad. Let's talk about, instead, frame rate bugs. Spawn-in animations of demons are tied to frame rate. For example, as soon as we get off the train, we guarantee that an imp is at an optimal location for a punch boost right there. And during a fight later, to guarantee that a revenant spawns in properly and doesn't hang around out of bounds. Hell, even in cultist space, we had to make sure that these falling soldiers go to the same location every time. In all three of these cases, FPS has to be limited to 100, because if your FPS is too high, the spawns will be different. Yeah. So, well, the meat hook is the attachment to the super shotgun in this game that gives us a speed towards an enemy to kill it violently. And guess what? That speed is frame rate dependent as well, and we get to use this to our advantage. Just like the BFG glitch from 2016, opening the weapon wheel allows us to slow down time and thus gain more speed, because overall we're on the hook for more frames. And then, we use that speed to skip to a later section of the level. But, you still have to grab things in the middle of the level, so you... All this spicy, spicy movement for a total of about 8 seconds of time save. <laughs> and, with all that yeeting, we get to a, our first boss fight, the Doom Hunter. Bosses in Eternal, well, at least this boss, are to push over. But wait, right through, there's two of them. Yeah, just do the same strategy, just one at a time. Well, at least it wasn't literally hitting two buttons and standing still though. And while after being such a good boy for killing two of the Hell Priests, we get a little treat called the Ballista. Wait, this is just a Gauss Cannon. They just called it the Ballista for no reason, and they nerfed the goddamn bass drop. Game's literally unplayable. Well, we get to put that to use in the next level, Super Gore Nest, which, in Doom Eternal, is the king of combat optimization. And if you don't believe it, well, just watch. I would go into more detail, but sometimes the game just speaks for itself. Okay, lore update. The Hell Priest decided to hide, like, really, really good. Like, way better than before. Uh-huh. So we need some help. Samuel Hayden is back on Earth, and we really need his help, so we'll head to... Art Complex will, without a doubt, instantly kill you. For no reason. 
There are just a lot of close encounters, with as many demons densely packed as a sadistic developer can fit. Luckily, Destroyer Blade is a good mod attachment that goes as hard as your mother and can help me immensely. If you liked combat optimization, Arc has its own spin on things. There's an important part of combat that I haven't touched yet, known as Trigger Demons. Basically, only certain demons need to be killed for the encounter to progress. It's not as always simple as, every demon is dead, although those situations definitely exist. A wacky encounter where this comes into play is beneath this Slayer Gate here. As it turns out, 85% of the demons do not need to be killed, because all that matters for completing the encounter is this Arachnotron, this Prowler, and all these fodder demons over here. Of course, this makes the fight dangerous, as that we have to leave several scary demons. However, we do this because it's faster by about 15 seconds. And after moving on from that, another aspect that isn't very readily obvious is spawn limit. This game has a hard cap of how many AI can be spawned at any given time. The limit for this game is 32 demons. And if you're curious, Doom 2016 surrounds 16. I gotta keep that in mind, because as I pass this area in Mario's restaurant, I gotta make sure I kill a lot of demons or else spawn cap will be reached, making the rest of the level slow. Now normally, to keep spawn cap not reaching its max, there are normally many triggers throughout the level that despawns demons you left alive. However, we skip the next despawn trigger because of this skip, which we call Hentai. And right at the end of the level, we have to deal with the Marauder. This demon, we can't just shoot. We have to play red light, green light with it. <laughs> and poor dude. He didn't even know that was a children's game. And now, the portal out of here just spawned. So... Wait, 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 wait. We gotta grab the rest of the stuff in the level. But thankfully, us skipping to the end unlocks a neat feature. Fast travel. So instead of traveling everywhere on foot like a fucking casual, we could just teleport to the areas we missed and grab everything. And before you say it, 2016 did not have a feature like this. So we had to grab everything on the way to the end. And we put that to use here because we skipped about 60% of the level, so we can go back and do everything more efficiently. That level is densely packed with stuff, but now that we got Hayden here, he probably has a lot of stuff to say to us. I mean, after all, he betrayed us at the end of the last game, and we have a lot of unresolved tension. Final priest is hiding in Sentinel Prime. Oh, never mind, we're chill, I guess. So it turns out, in order to kill that Hell Priest, we gotta go back to Doom 2016. Luckily, for that game, I'm bringing a present. <laughs> It's back, you loved it, it's no longer as overpowered as the first game, it's the BFG, the Bingus for Gentlemen. It works a little bit differently in this game. For one, it holds two shots. For two, we have no ammo boost so we can't get our BFG back all the time. For three, we still have ways to get- We still have way- Oh God's sakes. This game has a little bit of an issue where firing the BFG can cause the game to crash and 90% of the crashes are caused by glory killing right before BFG. And to be optimal in the speedrun, we have to ride this line close a lot. And to give the devs of the game credit, they did fix this issue in a later patch of the game, but it's faster to be played on an earlier version of the game. On current patch, a lot of the speedrun skips are undoable, there are some fights that are reworks that are way slower, and various tech no longer works in the game. So if you're running all campaigns of the game, it's optimal to play on patch 5.1 for the fastest time. And for those curious, it'd be about 10 minutes of time loss in the Eternal campaigns from not playing on the most optimal patch. Anyways, we still have ways to get back BFG ammo. You see, when we upgrade ammo by grabbing one of these crystals, it fills up all of Doomguy's ammo, including the BFG. And we use that a lot in this level. But now, here we are at Sentinel Prime. This is the Sentinel homeworld, and we needed to blow a hell into the center of Mars to get here. Despite us going to the city of Exultia on Sentinel Prime, 
five missions ago. Good writing. Here is where the third Hell Priest is, and we have to kill him and his guardian. Now, this man may be goat with the shield, but gladiator? More like badiator. And the second phase, we kill his shield, which was a per- I don't want to think about the ethical ramifications of that. He uses the opportunity to reclass from a fighter to a barbarian. And now that all three Hell Priests are dead, that means the demonic invasion has stopped. The credits roll, and we go on to the DLC. If you had let the culling continue, the human race you fight to protect would have survived. Now I will resurrect the icon of sin. Well, looks like we gotta prep up and go back to Sentinel Prime to grab our mega weapon. So after going through the center of Mars to teleport us back to Sentinel Prime, of which we totally did off screen, we go to a level that I really like. However, there isn't just much to talk about here. The only thing I want to mention is that we can shoot targets through walls, you know, to open up further areas, as long as the shot goes through water first. You might be asking how that works, and, well, that's just the game. That's just the game. So the rest of the level goes like this. We BFG, we shoot, we BFG, we crucible. Fuck, I mean crocobile. But the crocobile is a lightsaber in this game that can kill any enemy in one hit. Suffice it to say, I use this for every enemy that is just really annoying. After testing it out, going back and finishing the final Slayer Gate, we move on to the final four levels of the game, which is an onslaught to the end. But first, it's your favorite part, three minutes of battery insertion cutscenes. Finally, some real gameplay, and not whatever this is. The only thing that holds me back at this section is the glory kill challenges. So there are level challenges in this game, much like Doom 2016, I just haven't mentioned most of them because they're pretty easy. Necrovol 1 and 2 have exceptions. There are a total of three glory kill challenges. This is hard to do for several reasons. In Necrovol Part 2, Electric Boogaloo, the Archvile and the Tyrant Glory Kill challenges can only be attempted once. There is no other Archvile or Tyrant in the whole level. Sometimes, the demon could just not get into a Glory Kill state, despite having the HP necessary for it. And this has to do with some weird animation overlapping where the Glory Kill state's impossible. Which I don't quite understand, but heh, there's some nerds for it. So, the odds for completing a challenge when getting to a run are lower than 100%, which isn't a good sign. But even getting into Glory Kill, there are issues. For example, you need to Glory Kill an Archfile from the left side, but the demon's left side is covered by a special type of collision in this game known as walls. It's impossible to complete the challenge, which feels great during a run. Suffice it to say, this game is not at all consistent with how it works, so I allow use of a strategy to even the odds. It's a very particular thing that only the most dedicated of speedrunners know. It's called Alt F4. It's a keyboard shortcut left in by the devs that allows me to time travel back to the previous checkpoint and try it again. You only have to deal with the side effect that this closes the game. 
But after getting the Archvile, all we have to do is do the same thing for the Tyrant, where we get the most value from a single BFG shot in the run. <laughs> So, you might have been asking, where's the lore update? Where are we going? Well, we're going to heaven. So, we had to fight through hell, jump into this interdimensional laser, and ride to heaven. So we can slap the crap out of the head angel and tell them that demonic invasions are cringe. And now that we're in the section of heaven known as Erdak, I would explain all the movement stuff, the combat optimizations, and more, but... I've made an entire video breaking down this level, so I'd recommend you just watch that. Go there, there's 40 minutes if you want to, you know, get all the juicy details. But here are the highlights. There's combat, combat, rings, eat to another arena, send one BFG round to kill two arenas at once, eat into another arena, combat, eat out of the arena, hit a button, return to the arena, eat out of that arena for a second time, and then finish the arena with the best precise shot in the whole game. Oh, also boss fight. And this boss fight is fucking tricky. There are five phases to it. And each phase, you need to send a total of six rockets at the maker and then give her a smack. And to make matters worse, in order to do this, we only have enemies scattered throughout the arena that can instantly refill our health and ammo. Haha. <laughs> However... So now that we've met our maker, we still need to take out their super secret mega weapon, and we still have one more atrocity to commit. This level is not too complicated, and it's what people love about this game. It's just combat gauntlet after combat gauntlet after combat gauntlet. Now after all the required combat is done, we have a sick ass trick to get to the final boss. We BFG this archfile from a precise spot where we set up for a yeet hook. After waiting for us to be given a checkpoint by the indicator in the top right, we dash back to spawn in a revenant, yeet hook onto it, and right when we hit an invisible wall, a cutscene plays from the encounter ending that despawns the invisible wall. And. Since it's no longer there, we get to keep all that momentum right to the end of the level. And here we are. Heaven's Mega Weapon, the Icon of Sin. The final boss fight of Doom Eternal. So we have a combat arena with many demons, and we have to start for text from the- Finish this fight. Yeah, this fight is practically an auto-scroller for all intents and purposes, as we have to wait for the icon to give all these armor break animations before we get to the second phase. This fight is honestly such a cakewalk that we farm mastery for micro-missiles and the energy shield while it's happening. But with those mastered, that puts us at 100% completion right after we combine the two mega ultimate weapons into one. We've stopped the demonic invasion, as Samuel Hayden said, You've won. But Victory in a war isn't good enough for the Doom Slayer or this challenge, so we move on to the DLCs called The Ancient Gods. So, after the plot of the main game, Doom Guy and Hayden team up to destroy, like, every demon ever. Like, period. And that brings us to this oil rig. Now, the DLC starts with our whole kit and every weapon mastered, every rune unlocked, and everything else you'd expect. So, 100%ing the base game is canon as far as we're speaking. And speaking of cannons, because everything is mastered, this unlocks a little bit of weapon tech that we didn't have access to in the base game because we were, well, mastering everything while doing it. The biggest trick in this run is called Fast Destroyer Blade. The balancing of the Destroyer Blade is that it deals a lot of damage, but has a large charge-up time to compensate for it. By doing a precise setup to get into a state called a combo swap chain, we can confuse the game to think that we're charging the Arbalist, when in actuality, we're charging Destroyer Blade. 
and since the Arbalest charges faster, it's net time save. The setup is pretty technical and has a lot of stuff going on, so I'm gonna rapid fire it at ya. First, we mod swap while on the Arbalest. Cancel that mod swap by swapping to the Heavy Cannon. Swap back to the Arbalest, charge it, fire it and hit an enemy, and bam. Next time I charge the Destroyer Blade, it will be as fast as the Arbalest. Oh, by the way, if you start a combo swap chain and then swap to the Super Shotgun, you'll just telepathically put the bullets in. The reason we need fully mastered Ballista for this trick, because the mastery for the Arbalest resets the cooldown of the Arbalest when it hits an enemy. This reset function is what's possible for the Destroyer Blade to charge like it's the Arbalest. How exactly does it... Um, we have no idea, but it seems like there's some generality in the code between the Arbalest and Destroyer Blade, making them confuse each other somewhat. Because of the setup for Fast Destroyer Blade takes time, we try to do it whenever we're waiting for anything. But oh boy, it doesn't stop there. Combining this tech with another mod swap tech called Double Destroyer Blade, it makes it even better. This tech we actually did in the base game. But because Ballista gives us speed, ammo is tightly routed, so we can't be wasting 50 ammo on an extra Destroyer Blade often. But in the DLCs, we have way more ammo, and thus way more leeway to use it that way. We use Double Destroyer Blade way, way often. Um, how it works is a little complicated, but heck, that's never stopped me. Basically, if we open up the weapon wheel and swap mods on another weapon while firing the Destroyer Blade, the game gets confused and thinks that it isn't firing the Destroyer Blade anymore. And in this, oh fuck, I'm supposed to be firing it, but I'm not phase, a failsafe sends out another attack. Two blades in one firing animation. At least, that's how we think it works. If any software engineer at id knows what it is specifically and wants to talk to me, I'm just saying I'm open to it. This trick is all kinds of buggy, as it only works when swapping from specific mods. Like, swapping from sticky bombs to full auto makes a double destroyer blade. But swapping from full auto to sticky doesn't. However, swapping from full auto to sticky, it can make you double arbalist by the exact same method. So the game must be linking the Ballista mods, and all other mods, somehow. But that's some spaghetti that we'll probably never figure out how it works. Oh sorry, uh, the game. We're here to destroy the oil rig and figure out what these demons were hiding. Unfortunately, because I explained all that Ballista tech, I've wasted all my time for this level, so let's speedrun this. There's a lot of cool Ballista tech? Huh, who would have thought? There's combat, punch boosting, combat, oh, I should probably explain punch boosting. How that works is that most games have a mechanic called a melee lunge, where if you try to melee something and you aren't close enough, the game will give you speed so that you can make contact with that target. And guess what? That's frame rate dependent as well. If that lunge is interrupted, we get to keep the speed. Oh, the fastest way to swim in Doom Eternal is by going diagonally, Pythagoras is rolling over in their grave, combat, and welcome to this segment called Funny Ways to Kill a Marauder. Number one, hooking onto him after he jumps. Number two, blocking his spawn in animation. And number three, him not spawning in whatsoever. This has been Funny Marauder Kills, signing off. So what we're looking for is Jesus' body. And since you remember that Jesus is Samuel Hayden from 2016, he's back to normal. The whole reason we got him his body is so that he can be a sick-ass boss fight later in the DLC. Now this, <laughs> the Blood Swamps, is the best level in like every Doom ever. Fight me, nerds. And if you doubt me, just listen to the music. But that's not even, like, the beginning. The best part about its level is its insane combat. There are no Slayer Gates in this level. However, you'd be forgiven for thinking that, because a couple of these fights go so, so hard. And after all that, we get to the first boss fight of the DLC, and it's a box. Well, because, I don't, I don't know, like, Geometry is a demon too. 
And after fighting those boxes, a titan rises up to a platform where we touch father's balls. And no, I will not explain that. After we touch it, we decide to take another ball that's a little more... <laughs> and thanks to the sphere of evil, we're able to go back to heaven where us fucking it up during the base game did quite a bit of damage to it. Here in the Otter Den, we get ranged marauders, which are fun, but we also get the hardest encounter in the entire game. Oh, also Vega is here, and he's God. If you're wondering why I said that out of nowhere, that's what the game does. The Slayer Gate of this level's final combat phase is a marauder, except it's been possessed by a spirit that makes it twice as fast, twice as resistant, and be 10 million times a pain in the ass. But don't worry, as a certified spood rammer, we have a strategy. You see, all we have to do is fire the BFG right before it spawns, and hopefully... And whoa, I'm not joking when I'm saying that this Marauder surviving could end the whole run. Marauders are notoriously janky in this game, and when possessed, they constructively interfere wavelengths, making it a major threat. But after that headache, a concept that becomes a little more apparent in this level, thus I'll explain it, is a strategy called the fun zone. We, we tried to shore that up, to make it, to hold the player accountable, to not let them out of the fun zone. This applies to enemies that rely on counter windows like Bloodmakers, Marauders, and the soon to be introduced Armored Barons. When they spawn, if you are the right amount of distance away, they will instantly use their counterable attack. Thus, we can instantly kill them. Neato. So this game, we have to make a final choice of what arena to face before we fight the final boss of the DLC. We specifically go the left path, because we can short circuit this fight by using one single BFG, Speedy. And after a hop and a jump, we're at the final boss, Sammy Hady. Now, Samuel Hayden, he's just super jealous of our sick ass ball and wants to fight us for it. In order to fight him, we have to shoot at him until he dies. And when he shields himself, he spawns in demons that we need to destroy spirits. Why can an angel control demons from hell out of nowhere? Shut up, nerd. Quit thinking about the plot, sheesh. Luckily, if we BFG right before the cutscene where he spawns in the demons, we actually kill the enemies before the spirits possess them. And then, we can zap the spirits out of existence with the meme beam. For those wondering, that's how you kill spirits. It's so slow. Uh, these are the only spirits we kill in the entire run. And then the next phase is an auto-scroller. Then we have another punch out with Hayden. And then we get to the phase where we gotta kill some more demons and spirits again. And this last phase is dangerous because a Pain Elemental and a Dread Knight get possessed. Now these are some heavy demons that when possessed deal a literal fuck ton of damage. Usually. What we do is we charge the Destroyer Blade before the cutscene and hit the Pain Elemental as it spawns so that it's at low health before it gets possessed. Good game. Good game. But if you can't do the Destroyer Blade strategy or get unlucky where the game crashes mid-encounter, the strategy is to lock on the Pain Elemental and then bombard it with Micro Missiles. This will kill any lost souls the Pain Elemental throws at us, allowing us to have just free damage, although being a little slower. And then we just lock on the Dread Knight until it dies, killing the last spirit and ending the fight. Hayden, more like Hades hey, nuts when I punch you in the mouth. And he disappears out of embarrassment from getting Ligma that hard, and we resurrect the devil. And finally, we're done with this DLC. But also, the devil is us, but that's in the details. Let's get into part two. It's our final trip to Sentinel Prime, and it's also the best level in terms of speedrunning. There are cool combat strategies, unique movement, and some pretty cool sequence breaks, and they all blend together. On top of it all off, we get a new tool to play with, the hammer. This tool allows us to restack health, armor, and ammo, while also stunning every demon around us. It's broken, but it's also super fun. A funny thing is that we also get introduced to the stone imps, which are very annoying demons that we're meant to use full auto on to kill. 
but a bash from the energy shield just kills them instantly. So we do that the whole time. But the cool thing about this level is that we get the only use of this tech in the whole gosh darn six hour run. Energy shield, vacation. Basically, punching out of an energy shield lets us pull up another weapon with the shield still active. And then we get to use this to set up a destroyer blade, double destroyer blade, and now this whole encounter is dead. And now that the corpses of enemies lie in our wake, we can grab this super special crystal and get back to a good planet. So it turns out, demons are still on Earth. Looks like us stopping the invasion from the base game meant fucking nothing. Regardless, there's a super special teleporter here that we need to fight our way to, and the hammer is really, really useful for that. Well, in this encounter, we can stunlock the whole encounter. The only instance of spawn blacking in the run happens in this level. Practically, if the spawn point of an enemy is occupied by a Slayer or another AI, the enemy just doesn't spawn in. And now, now that we're at the teleporter, for the final time, we can go to the place that Kip would always tell me to go in high school. Fuck you, Kip. Going there myself. Alright, so if you're wondering where all my excellent plot analysis has went, don't worry. This is the level where the plot happens. So we teleport in, all our Sentinel friends teleport with us to kill the demons, and then Avengers Endgame happens. So we're here waging war on the demons, because believe it or not, awakening the devil was a bad idea. Who would have thought? And now we gotta siege the capital city of hell. So what what was the point of the teleporter and the crystal if any sentinel warrior could teleport here? It was to make the DLC longer, obviously, you nerd. Quit thinking about it. So this level is just a final rush of combat and movement to the final boss. So without further ado... And when we get into the city, we're actually on a timer. <laughs> the enemies here do not despawn, and we need these spawns to be open for big arenas later. So we immediately hook off a pain elemental to get out of here ASAP. And you have to be as fast as possible, or else bad things can happen. But luckily, we get to have fun right after. You see, these demonic troopers, native to Amora, have literally zero HP. So if we dash into them with the energy shield, we lose our dash state, but we get to keep our speed and... Yippee! And we get to the final encounter where... Just kidding. What actually happened was that the game got into an uncontinuable state called a softlock. For those wondering specifics, this encounter can softlock if you are close to spawn limit, which is exactly what happened. Luckily, Alt f 4 fixes the spawn limit issue. Anyways, here's how the encounter is supposed to look like. Now you might be wondering why I spent so little time on the capital city of hell, it seems like it'd be a fun place to have combat arena, store, lorry, all that other jazz, but that's how long it is in the game. And I like the narrative cohesion of this being exactly the same way. So this is the Dork Lord. Now he's the final boss that's basically a big marauder. We have to wait for him to an attack with a counter window, hit it, and then hammer him to stun him so we can shoot the ever-living Doom guy off him. We would shoot around the shield just like in the gladiator boss fight, however, the devs thought it'd be a good decision that if you ever shoot him, you know, when he's not blocking, that he'd just heal. Because that makes sense. There are very specific damage cycles that we have to give this guy in the second, third, fourth, and fifth phase for maximum damage output. Now, these damage cycles, these optimal numbers, these optimal weapon combos, they aren't the most difficult thing in the world. But after six hours of pure combat, movement tech, and chat wearing you down, it's hard. And with nerves piled high, the Shadow the Hedgehog's incessant reliance on randomness for every attack they do, 
it's it's just it's just not easy. Doob 2016, Doob Turtle, Ancient Gods 1, Ancient Gods 2, 100% Ultra Nightmare. Back to back to back, single segment. Let's fucking go. On November 28th, much like an anime, I beat this god. And if you know anything worth your salt, you know, I typically stream with a camera. But the whole reason that most of this video was without it was I actually got COVID the week before this run and was bedridden for several days. The stream was just at the point where I felt good enough to try attempts again, and I was still feeling quite unwell. So the cam was off, so no one had to watch me sniff from my pile of tissues and watch me drink my Gatorade. Perhaps those commercials about athletes drinking that stuff was not completely false. I was so sick and I, the, the, the adrenaline Beat the, beat the frickin' snot out of me. So kids, you wanna beat my time? And now, my newfound record? Just fly to your local COVID clinic and start licking the toilet seats, and then start chugging your favorite athlete drink. Cause after all, it's no fun if there's no competition. So if you have three years of your life to dedicate to learning the run and practicing like I have, get at it. And maybe I'd have to do this again. So thanks y'all for stopping by. This run was literal months in the working for me if you only include the attempts. And it was the culmination of three years of speedrunning for me. So it means a lot that you would watch this. I stopped seriously speedrunning Doom Eternal and decided to work on this video, and I don't regret the time I've had in the game. For those who don't know, me completing this run was my last goal in Doom Eternal speedrunning. There's no reason to continue playing the game anymore? Yeah, you're fucking right. Boo, boo, boo. Doom Eternal. Proper manage, uninstall. Fuck this game forever. Stupid. Fuck this game. <laughs> I'll start rolling out some alternative content from now on. You can expect a critique or a review every once in a while. A continuation of the physicist plays where I'll play some other games that tackle physics concepts and use them as a vehicle to discuss physics ad nauseum. And probably some speedrun related stuff on whatever game I pick up next. As well, don't think I'm just stopping the Doom stuff. I'll still have fun talking about Doom and Doom speedrun stories. I just won't be speedrunning it. And if you're more of a fan of my highlight-ish content, I have an editor who's working with me on that stuff while I handle more well-thought-out projects that need personal touches like this one. Her name's Irina, give her a follow on YouTube and Twitch, and flood her comments asking when the next video is going to be done because that will definitely not annoy her and cause her to quit. Be the first person to subscribe to my Patreon, or become a YouTube mentor if you want to financially support me. More money I get means the more time I can dedicate to these videos, which means I won't have to get a job, which means I'd be able to make more. That'd be pretty nice. It takes a lot of effort to do these runs, script for them, and finally edit them. So if you appreciate all that, support however you can. Of course, only watching is fine too, don't get me wrong. Provided you turned off the ad blocker, you unethical- f All right, now that everyone's clicked off the video, I can share something spicy. Just for you, the most dedicated of fans. Ligma. <laughs>